Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode number 103 of the Big Time Shrink podcast. Uh, really excited today, as always. I um, have a great coach on here, Coach Dakota Kuhn. Um, we'll get to him in just one second. Uh, before we get to that, let's just get to our sponsors it's right out of the gate here. Team Builder. They're the leading software for high schools and colleges by providing coaches their ability to write programs online, generate over 13 reports, and even train athletes remotely for site income. If you sign up with code Big Time, you will receive a free programming template, which works automatically within Team Builder. No more spreadsheets and workout cards to track training maxes that change day by day. Automate your programming without outsourcing your programming with Team Builder. They're going to come really in handy. I've already said it like the last 10 episodes, I think, but really handy in this uh, quarantine period uh, where athletes are going to be coming in and out of quarantine. We already have. Um, I'm sure a lot of you listening have already dealt with that, but we're just going to set up a situation. we got a two-week 14-day um, quarantine program they can do in the room, and uh, we can give that to them through Team Builder very easily. It's going to make that kind of transition seamless for us. So really appreciate Hewitt and his gang, as usual, um, for supporting the show. Our next sponsor is Powerlift. They are the leading manufacturer and distributor of heavy-duty strength training equipment for collegiate and high school athletic performance centers around the world. Powerlift brings over 20 years of experience to the strength conditioning world, all products are manufactured in their state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Jefferson, Iowa. They're proud to support all coaches making the big time where they're at. Um, we'll try to get this episode uploaded on YouTube so you can see our faces, but um, our guest has a powerlift shirt on today. So that's, uh, he's here repping powerlift. Um, great people um, at powerlift and all their information is in the show notes. If you need help with the room or just a uh, small piece of equipment as well, uh, their information is in the show notes. All right, I want to get to today's episode. We'll get here quick. We're kind of short for time, possibly a little bit today. Um, Coach Dakota Kuhn, he is um, – we kind of first met at Northwest Missouri State, another person from Joe Quinlan's tree. Joe actually kind of talked about him a little bit on our, our last episode, episode number 100 with Joe. Um, but he's – I've always been super impressed with just his approach, his ability to learn, um, and he's just doing fantastic things. So, Coach Kuhn, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Doing great, man. And I appreciate um, everybody. This is just a, such a busy time for everybody. I know everybody's kind of running around with their like chickens with their head cuts off, cut off. So uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us. And why don't you get us rolling and um, talk a little bit about your journey so far in strength conditioning. All right. Well, again, thanks for having me on. Love all the stuff that you guys do. Obviously, I've been consider you a mentor and a friend in the field uh, ever since I met you and love the podcast and learned a lot from it over over all the episodes. Um, but no, for me, uh, I was really lucky. Um, I kind of found strength and conditioning as a young kid. I kind of grew up in a rough situation and um, had a high school strength coach kind of pull me away um, from kind of the bad things that I was going through in life and, you know, showed me the weight room and showed me uh, training and things like that. And I, and I really fell in love with it at a young age. So um, I was really, really fortunate to where when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, so I started working uh, as an intern for him throughout high school. Um, fortunate enough, when I got done in high school, I was able to go to Concordia University, a small NAI school in Nebraska, uh, play football there and studied exercise science. Um, while I was there, didn't really know what I was going to do in the summers uh, besides train for football. Um, so went and volunteered at the local high school, uh, coach Jamie Opfer there. He gave me a great opportunity and really just allowed me to jump head first into coaching, um, which I really attribute, um, just being, just being able to be in front of kids. I think it started at that young age for me, um, which really helped me out there. So was able to help coach some football there and ran all their summer weights programs and was involved in that. So I was lucky there. Uh, from there, we finally got a full-time strength coach about my, I think it was my junior year when I was at Concordia. And I think the first day he was on campus, I started bugging him to come intern for him. Uh, so worked for him. Uh, he gave me some opportunities to kind of run some of the smaller teams, the tennises and cheer and dance and stuff like that. And again, just, you know, getting opportunities to be in front of kids, I think is something that was super important that I value. Um, from there, I was able to go to Vanderbilt University uh, with Coach James Dobson, who was previously at Nebraska, uh, which is kind of where we started our relationship. Uh, had a great time there, went down to Nashville for the summer, uh, worked really hard there, was the only intern, so felt like I was running around uh, with, like a chicken. 
but uh, learned a lot, a great experience. Um, from there, was fortunate to be able to go to Northwest Missouri under Coach Joe Quinlan. Uh, obviously, we, we met there, and we know the greatness of that program and, and what Coach, Coach Q does for everybody. So started off there as an intern, um, and then he kind of found me a role as a, as a GA. Uh, my first, first semester as a GA, I kind of worked through the fitness center as well, and then kind of transitioned into more of a full-time weight room spot and led the uh, women's soccer team and the track and field teams there. Uh, learned a lot. One of the best experiences I think I could have ever asked for changed me, not just as a coach, but as a person. Um, and then graduated from there, and then I came up here to Wayne State uh, under head coach Grant Darnell. And uh, I kind of serve as the lead assistant for our department and kind of oversee our uh, developmental football and our baseball programs um, and work with our interns and GAs and just kind of help out anywhere I can. Thanks for uh, diving into that, Coach. And the, I mean, you've got experience all the way from high school, clear up to the SEC football and kind of everywhere in between, which is just fantastic. So I, I'm just kind of curious. Um, what have you kind of noticed uh, just between all those levels, just differences or similarities or just, just any overall observation between those three levels? Um, I think the biggest thing, and just from a coaching standpoint too, is I think it all comes down to relationships with the kids. Um, you know, whether it's a, a small high school kid from Nebraska or, you know, like you said, an SEC football player, you know, they're all kids at the same time and people are people and, I think you need to dive in, dive into the person and not just the sport or the, you know, the Jersey and, and actually get to know them. And I think that was something that really helped me out at Vanderbilt where, you know, I walked in and I was this, you know, <laughs> kid that didn't know anything. And, you know, I had great support from coach Dobson and everything, but, you know, he really encouraged me to get to know the guys and, you know, made me feel comfortable. But at the same time, when you, get to know the kids at all those different levels, it makes it a little bit easier to coach them and, and, and push them a little bit too at the same time. So. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I've always appreciated your, you're always pretty intentional at kind of establishing those relationships what I've, from what I've seen. And um, certainly that stands out about your, your ability to coach. So um, let's talk a little bit about kind of just the culture you guys have there. What, how would you describe your culture there at Wayne State? Yeah, I think we're, I think we're building something special. Um, you know, we have a lot of new coaches coming into our programs, um, a lot of new great kids coming in and, you know, we're really trying to build, um, uh, that culture of togetherness and everything that we do is for the people around us. Um, not so much, not that we're not concerned with, you know, individual achievement in a session or hitting weights on a certain set or, you know, running a, a 10 or something like that, but. You know, something we try to say to the guys is it's, it's not about what you do, but it's about what the group can do. You know, we care more about the group having a great session than one individual having a great session. So, you know, I think it kind of goes back to, to, to Joe's episode, you know, in that consistently being good, you know, and it's anybody can have a one great day, but we want to have a lot of good days. And I think that's something that we're starting to build. Um, we had the most kids we've ever had around even during a pandemic once we were able to get back into stuff and you know we had kids here right away as soon as we could get them in with precautions and stuff um which was something that hadn't really happened before so that's a really exciting time for us as a department and, and everything so we're really excited about that well that that says a lot what you kind of mentioned there you've had the most people stick around the summer that's a that's a difficult thing to do at the d2 level not in a yeah. pandemic you know, and, and to be able to pull that off in a pandemic just says, like, you guys are building something great there. That's, that's great. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. we got some great kids and great coaches, and we're looking, looking for the future. How many, how many athletes do you guys have there, do you know, off the top of your head? I think we're like four or 500. So with the small staff, it would be a little bit bigger than what we're dealing with here at William Joe College. I'm, I'm sure there's – some ways you're trying to optimize just efficiency, training, stuff like that. Is there any like resources or methods that you're using there to just kind of optimize flow or, or workflow or whatever it is? Um, so we're not, we're not at the point where, you know, we're able to have some of the, the training technology and stuff like that. Um, I think that's some of the stuff that, you know, we're trying to look at down the road of, of possibly adding. 
Um, but something that we really try to focus on is just really being prepared for every day and, and not, you know, not having questions about what's going to happen here and here. And, you know, as we both know, like as a co as a strength coach, you know, you have to be willing to adapt to stuff. And I think we do a really good job of having a backup plan to a backup plan kind of thing, you know, of, um, our facility, I don't know if you've ever been here, we're, we're actually under the football stadium. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of room. We have a bunch of pillars going on and we do the best, we have a nice facility and we do the best with it what we can, but kind of the flow and stuff, sometimes it can get a little messy. So um, I think it's just really being organized and, and being in a plan and having that, you know, kind of laid out to where we know, okay, when a group comes in, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this as a warm up. We're going here and here, a coach is going to be here. Um, you know, and then while coach Darnell might be talking to a group, breaking them down, you know, me and a, the GA and an intern, we might be going back through setting the room up and just trying to have that as little flow to a group to group as possible that we can, like just to keep the athletes kind of moving at a good pace. Absolutely. And that's just so critical. Um, I was reading a book the other day and I can't remember what book it was, but essentially it came down to preparation and the author was talking about I'm sure it's a Jocko book now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but, yeah, the quote was basically like, leave, leave the chaos for the uncontrollable. So like, you know, the more you can prep, the more you can plan. And that's what me and my staff did all this week because we're going to start training teams Monday. It's like, you should have a really good idea of like how things are going to go. And then knowing that it won't go exactly that way. But if you can plan for the most you possibly can and then – you can save all your energy and time to address the chaos when the chaos comes in. And I just love that quote, like save the chaos for the uncontrollable control what you can. And that comes down to planning. So I think it's a great point. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's great. And I mean, I think that's something that's like, you have to kind of be willing to give up some time beforehand, you know, and doing some, some meetings and talking through different, you know, different stuff that might come up. You might need to take some time out beforehand to be able to set your up, you know, set yourself up for, success later kind of thing so yeah and that's what yeah and I just from my standpoint I get I get to the office probably an hour before I absolutely need to you know I could I could probably show up an hour later and probably you know walk out there and start coaching you know 15 minutes before a session it'd probably be okay but I get there and I sit and I go through everything and I have a plan so if I don't do that when the days I'm rushed or something comes up that was outside of my control or whatever and I just feel rushed it just doesn't go very well I and mean, it just doesn't so that's just a huge you gotta prep you gotta prep for those sessions um just like you would anything else for sure absolutely like you said it's probably you know it's not certainty <laughs> right exactly yeah exactly how about coach give me a, a tough hurdle you've had to overcome during your coaching career um you know, I think not necessarily coaching, but, but for me, you know, I was I kind of had a rough situation growing up and I grew up with a, with a visual disability as well. And as I grew up, I was kind of always like just that quiet kid. You know, I, I didn't really talk a whole lot. I, I don't really know why, like, I, I'm sure both of those factors kind of factored into it, you know, and I didn't mind talking to people, you know, and I enjoyed the conversation and stuff like that, but I didn't necessarily go out of my way, you know, to interact with people and have those discussions and stuff. I just kind of hung out, you know, I still worked hard and kind of did what I needed to do and did my best and stuff, but wasn't the most, you know, out, outgoing person, I guess. And I think that's something that, you know, as a, as a strength coach, you have to be you have to be true to yourself, you know, and, and the athletes are going to know that. But at the same time, you know, I don't think you can be an, an, an introvert kind of, you know, and it's not doing the, the crap that you see on ESPN. You know, it's actually talking to kids. And, you know, like I remember going to, you know, my first day at Northwest and setting up a, a, a warm up station and then just standing there, you know, waiting for the kids to come over. And I was going to coach them when they got there. But Joe came over to me and said, hey, you know, go talk to a kid, you know, and interact with them, get to know them and kind of thing before we even get into the workout. And I think that's something that has been a challenge for me. And I've kind of challenged myself to go out of my way to be uncomfortable, to 
to talk more and be more comfortable in that situation. And, you know, it's something I still work on all the time, but, you know, I, I definitely think I've gotten better at it over the years, but it, it, it was tough in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's so easy for coaches just to, like you said, kind of wait for the athletes to come to you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I fall into that trap just as much as anybody else. Um, but just taking the initiative on, on starting those conversations, I think is a huge thing that the really good coaches are able to pull off. Um, you know, coach, you brought up kind of your visual uh, disability. Do you mind just kind of diving into that a little bit more and just maybe kind of the approaches you take to coaching to address that? Yeah. Um, so I have ocular albinism. Um, so I'm legally blind. Um, so I can't really see distance and detail at the greatest level. Um, it's kind of hard to explain to somebody like what I see because I don't really know like what you guys see. Hmm. But, uh, um, you know, it's a challenge from a coaching standpoint because I can't be that coach that just like stands there and watches the room, you know? And, but I think the, the silver lining of it is, is like it forces me to like, I can't just be that coach. Like I have to move around the room and like, I, I you know what I mean? Like, I can't stand in one end of the room and like make sure, you know, the guy on rack one is doing squats right or something. So, you know, I have to constantly be moving around, um, which is a big thing for me. So I think, you know, that's a, you know, a different situation. I think I've started to use mirrors more when coaching. I know some people don't like having the mirrors in the weight room, but I think that's helped me a lot too, where you can kind of, you know, bounce off and, and see different stuff there and the different angles. Um, but then the other thing too, that I, I really try to, you know, beat into the head of the athletes that I, that I work with is I have to have vocal stuff. Like I try to see facial expressions and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, facial expressions are a big thing in, in interacting with people, but I don't always connect with those right away. Um, so like if I'm explaining something to a group and I say like, Hey, like, all right, are we good? Is there any questions? Like, I can't just have ki like kids in the back, like nod their heads. Like I need vocal confirmation. Right. So I think that's something too, where like, it's been a challenge, but at the same time, like, I think it's a good thing because it almost forces the kids to, to have to be more vocal. And then, you know, I just think it kind of opens up that door for them to, you know, talk more with their group and, you know, challenge their partners a little bit and be just more of a vocal person which kind of goes back to me struggling with that. So I think it almost kind of forces everybody to be more outgoing. So, um, yeah, I love your just attitude about it. Just your, it's how it's helping you and not, um, like holding you down or anything. And I, you know, just watching you coach, it's never been anything that, I mean, you, you're just as effective a coach as anybody in their room. And just your, your approach with that has just always been really impressive to me. So I appreciate you sharing on that. That's awesome. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's flip gears a little bit. Let's talk a little bit training. Um, what, what is your training like philosophy or principles or however you want to answer that? It's a big question. Um, okay. Kind of however you want to answer that. Okay. Um, you know, for me, I think I want to build strong, functionally moving athletes. And I think, you know, when I first got in, got into the field, you know, for me, like I love to lift, you know, so I was just like all about lifting and I, you know, I, but I think at some point, not that I've definitely not that I've learned everything, but I think like, as I've gotten older and I've matured in the field, it's a lot more about performance now for me. And like, you know, it's great to have a strong athlete, but can the athlete move proficiently? And I think that's really important. So when I look at our, you know, our basic training plan, we're very generalized, with what we're going to do from a weight room standpoint, you know, to me, training is GPP sports specific. So the way I kind of explain it to coaches is I'm going to make an athlete an athlete and it's kind of your job to take that athlete and make him into a volleyball player, or make him into a soccer player. And I know, I know that's a little different than, than the route that some coaches go down. Um, but, you know, for me, I just think like if we can get an athlete that moves better, that has better mobility, that has some, some good, you know, functional strength and, you know, is explosive, like, well, isn't that something that's good for all athletes, you know, and not just one specific sport. So from that, I mean, digging just a little bit deeper into the details, you know, I'm, I'm a big three day a week training person 
Um, I like breaking up the volume. I, I kind of learned that West Side for Skinny Bastards template from Joe from a long time ago. And um, it's just something that's kind of stuck with me. Um, so I've kind of used that that template and idea. And then, you know, I've kind of gone around. I've, I've done some 5-3-1. I've, you know, I've done some true conjugate stuff with it. I'm a really big fan of APRE. Um, I had a lot of success with APRE when I was a kid or when I was a college athlete, really enjoyed that. And then have used that a lot with um, other athletes that I've coached. And I just think it puts us in a really good position where we can auto regulate for how they're feeling that day. You know, it's, if you tell a kid to do, you know, two doubles at, at 80%, well, you know, what if that kid stayed up last night because, you know, his girlfriend broke up with him or her mom passed away or something, you know, so 80% isn't always 80% kind of thing. And I think that as much as we can, you know, change the training specifically to that kid that day, um, I think it's an easy thing for us to do and get the best performance out of them. And it allows us, you know, to, to push them to be better, you know, of that challenge to, you know, push for that extra rep and really hit those numbers, but then keep us in a good training zone as well. So that's, that's kind of where I fall on that. With your APRE, are you adjusting load or are you monitoring by volume? I've done both. So I, I started off with that original, you know, the Brian Mann, uh, I think it's the 10, 6, and 3. Um, re I really like that, but I, I think some of those, the, on those down sets, the reps can get pretty dang high. <laughs> And, uh, you know, sometimes you can just get a kid that keeps going and it can get out of hand a little quick, I think. Um, so I started going by the volume. I, I think actually you were the one that originated it with Joe with the, you, you know, the, I think you're going off like the 82% or something. And then it's, you know, you do your four to eight and then you minus the, the two reps with the same weight on the two down sets. And that's something I, I've really liked the volume aspect of it and you know you dig more into these other training systems of you know like the system and you talk to these other coaches and something that I was always kind of taught is is volume is, is the thing that really breaks people down you know it's, it's not necessarily the intensity where you know you can go and do a, a super heavy single on something you know and you're going to be really mentally taxed but you know you might you might not be super sore but then if we go back and we do you know sets of eight and 10 and stuff like that on a, on a big exercise, you know, your, your volume gets up there pretty high, you're going to be pretty well beat down. So I kind of like that idea of managing the volume a little bit more over the intensity. Um, but that's just kind of what's worked for me. I don't know if it's right or not. No, I agree. And I didn't come up with that. I mean, I stole that from, uh, I think it was a lead FTS article from Mark Watts. I think Gary Schofield um, put something out about it too, but just adjusting. Oh, my <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, it just allows you to, uh, I don't know, I think I got better high quality work out of it too, by just adjusting the volume rather than the, uh, the intensity, but either way it works. I mean, it's, it's a great program. So, um, coach, how about just like resources? Um, are there any specific, you already kind of mentioned some programming stuff there, but are there any other like coaching resources or anything that you've really dived into that you really like? Um, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm going to be the first one to admit, I don't read a lot. <laughs> um, reading is a struggle for me. I got to get out all these magnifying glasses and all this other stuff that it, 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 it's just a process. Um, so <laughs> I do a lot of, uh, audio stuff. I'm a big podcast guy. Um, and you, you know, and just following people on Twitter and, and seeing stuff like that, you know, I try to you know, not just nail myself into, well, I want to learn, you know, I need to learn more about sports performance. You know, I might read an article about sports performance and then go read a Dave Tate article about powerlifting or, you know, go read a Mark Bell article about powerlifting or something like that, or, you know, follow a podcast or something like that, where it's still training related, but it's not necessarily, you know, this is how you need to train tennis players kind of thing. And I think I try to give myself just a large, you know, a, a, a wide platform of just training knowledge. So from that standpoint, you know, I, I'm a big elite FTS person. I think I'm on there almost every day trying to not buy a bunch of stuff <laughs> but, uh, uh, on elite FTS a lot. Um, 
Mark Bell's podcast. He has some different ones, but he, you know, he had, uh, he had Joe Ken on a while ago, like a four hour podcast, which was gold. Um, he just had a, I can't remember what his name is, but he had the, uh, the Lakers strength coach on. Which yeah. I haven't caught that one, but, uh, you know, some of those things. And then I honestly, man, I watch Twitter a lot. Um, I know, I can't remember what school he's at, but Craig Edwards, uh, I follow him on Twitter. He puts out some outstanding stuff, um, very basic stuff, but just, you know, really simple stuff. And um, I'm really big trying to learn more about contrast training, and he puts a lot of stuff out about that. So that's been big for me. Oh, cool. I'm going to look him up. I'm always looking for good. Honestly, I deleted Twitter off my phone <laughs> about a month ago just because it just, it's just becoming a cesspool. Um, yeah. But there's still obviously gold on there. So Craig Edwards, I'll look him up. That's great. Um, well, Coach, I, I really appreciate your time. Like I said at the start, like it's, it's a crazy time of year. Everybody's getting everything rolling again, trying to settle in the COVID on campus and adjust to uh, athletes being quarantined or whatever it is. So um, let's wrap this up. I got four quick questions for you. You ready? All righty. Uh, what's your best piece of uh, coaching advice you've ever received? Um, work hard for the people and, and not the outcome. And I think that's something I think Joe told me, a, a you know, some kind of iteration of that. And, you know, it's people, people over players. I like that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Something that hit me pretty hard when he told me. <laughs> Favorite band, not Guns N' Roses. Oh, geez. <laughs> Dakota is the biggest Guns N' Roses fan I've ever seen in my life. So, <laughs> man, I, honestly, I've been on a big Metallica kick lately. Okay, that'll Go, work. Going back through there. <laughs> Help me on that one. <laughs> What's a uh, favorite office snack? Okay, so anybody who knows me recently will know that I'm probably usually just carrying meals around, and they'll make me crap for that. Um, but I'm a big fan of just does like trail mix. It's calorie dense and it's quick to eat yeah because you're are you still bodybuilding are you you have a show coming up what's your plan with that uh not right now i'm trying to you know get all the work to you know work stuff together and then maybe compete sometime gotcha. next year so. yeah that's great um all right coach last one is you got 15 uh let's do two more because I, I am interested in this one you got 15 minutes to train uh what are you doing i'm probably doing some sort of deadlift variation um I'm a bit, I really like straight bar deads. Um, yeah. So <laughs> probably straight bar deads, um, some sort of squat and some back. A lot of awesome. Back. Sounds like a good lift. All right, last one. Um, we, we ask all of our guests this. A small school coach you think does a great job and deserves a shout out? All right, so I got, I got two for you. Um, one is my college strength coach, Todd Berner. Um, he's at Concordia University in Seward, Nebraska does a phenomenal job with, with not a whole lot. He's got 19 sports. He's a, I think he, I think he just now got a GA, um, but he, he is kicking butt with hundreds of hundreds of athletes and two facilities and somehow, you know, staying happy and, and crushing everything and they're pushing, really getting a lot better. So definitely coach burner. He's doing a great job. Um, and then somebody who's a little bit younger, um, kind of in my similar position is Peyton Franklin. Um, he was an intern at Northwest for a while. Uh, he's over at UCM now, and he's he's just somebody, again, who he has a lot of very general training knowledge, and he's somebody who, if I if I have a question on something, I'm usually, you know, he's in my first inbox of somebody to talk to about what's going on and, and ideas for stuff. So they've both been both been awesome. good reasons. Well, that's great. Um, possible future guests of the show. So that's, uh, that's, that's perfect. Well, Coach, again, really appreciate your time. Um, it's good seeing you and talking to you and hope, hope everything is going well and you guys are staying safe up there in Nebraska. And um, good luck this fall. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Thanks. Same to you. See you soon. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this show, um, Coach Kuhn just had awesome stuff there. Please give us a like, uh, leave us a comment, give us a five-star rating, whatever um, outlet you're listening on this uh, from. We don't ask for much, but if you had the five seconds to – give us a review or hit the five star button. Please do that. That helps us out uh, with a lot of things. Um, and I really appreciate everybody listening. Please stay tuned. We have a Facebook page coming out, hopefully sometime soon. Hopefully this it will be up by uh, time this show airs. 
uh, but you can search us big time strength on Facebook and we want to create a community um, of big time strength coaches that we can share ideas and get information about apparel and stuff coming out soon here too. So uh, that is it for episode 103. We will see you next week.